Ajeita. Trying to interrogate 
you know, in South Africa, a paradigm in which we can use to better answer to the situation in which we find ourselves. He's a philosopher, and not a, not just any philosopher, but a philosopher of change. You know, a philosopher of revolution. So it's gonna be detailed and I'm one of two English and they are true, but I'm boost out and most of strong or no 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 strong strong. So I guess it's new sense.
Alright. Um let me first begin by extending a sincere a sincere expression of gratitude for the invitation. Uh, it, it means more than usual invitations because it's an invitation by a relative of the PAC of Sohu. Um, the PAC, I'm, I'm not a voting man myself, I've never registered to vote, and I generally don't encourage others to do so. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, I mean, uh, we, we'll get into this in the process of the talk. Uh, I do think that uh, an interpretation of the critique of the PAC, of the very foundations of South Africa, is incompatible with the practice of voting post-1994. I think uh, serious interpretation of this critique, you know, if we take seriously the suspicion of the foundations of South Africa and their survival through the circus of 1994, then the act of voting is a, is a, is a legitimation. It's a concession of sorts to what arises after that process. So I think a proper, a radical consideration at the very foundations of that transition requires us to suspend the participation in, in political activities within the strictures of the constitutional order. To participate in the election is to take for granted the logic of the law as it exists. To enter into parliament is to swear to uphold the constitution. And if the constitution is by its very constitution the fundamental problem we are directed at, then it follows that it cannot be exacted, it cannot be answered through the very parliament that it creates. So, um, I'm a philosopher, uh, but uh, you know, I, I'm an African philosopher. I, by that I don't mean that I'm an African who is a philosopher. I mean that the, 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 the variety of philosophical activity that I engage in it is African philosophy. Uh, my interest in the activities of the PAC, uh, as well as the theory which arises out of the PAC's practice of struggle, I take from an insight from another guerrilla philosopher uh, from the Eritrean People's Liberation Front who's been in exile and teaching in the United States for the past 35 years, a brother, father by the name of Tsenai Serekepera. In a text of his published in 2007 called Contested Memories, he, he suggests this much. African philosophy has to engage in the systematic and critical study of indigenous forms of knowledge and know both practical and theoretical, focused on a critical return to the source which is a lived process of reclaiming the possibilities of our history from within the concrete concerns and issues of that history. Those of us engaged in African philosophy have to be willing to learn from and critically study the concrete practices of various African liberation movements and struggles. In, in, in far simpler words, Zenai Serekepet Khan is suggesting here that the very practice of engaging in the liberation struggle should be understood as a source, as a text of philosophy, that by studying the activities which are engaged in, in the process of the liberation struggle, we have there, in that encounter, a, a philosophical source which must be subjected to second order interpretation. It is following this invitation that I turn my attention, uh, you know, to, to the liberation movement, which is the PAC. Now, I must express some disappointment at the song that you sang when I rose. In fact, it had been my intention to ask of you to sing this song. I wanted us to use this song as a text in order to begin our examination in this talk. Now, the version of the song that you sang, I believe, is an ANC variety. It is 
not the Azanian variety. Uh, the ANC has taken up many things and, uh, <coughs> and poisoned them. The reason why I say that you are singing an ANC variety is because you use the word Amapuno. It's in a season, APAC, it's There's a conceptual distinction between Amapuno and Abamshope. Okay? Right? You see, when you say Amapuno, what you do is that you fragment uh, the white community into English speaking and African speaking. It is the Afrikaans variety that we call Amapuno. Now, Amapuno supposedly become a problem, especially after 1948, okay? So the point is that the, the distinction of whites into English, uh, into the English variety and the Afrikaans, and blaming the problem on the Boas, Amapuno, is of course to, to turn your attention away from, from the English, from the 1820 settlers, from the Union of South Africa. I, I hope that you understand. The, the Azanian tradition, one of its principal deviations from the rest of the supposed liberation movement is precisely on understanding the question of Abam Shope rather than Amapu. Okay, this is this is is very important. Uh, it's very important because white liberals become exempted from Amapu. That's why Joe Slovo could sing to Bulipu. Because Joe Slovo Agassi. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> you, you need to understand this is very serious. The rendition that you sang is very serious in terms of the history of the political contest in South Africa about what the precise antagonism is. If the antagonism is indeed conquest, okay? You guys say settler. This is not really a term that I myself would use. It's a rather benign term that describes, you know, Ushala, Abashali, Abashali, settlers. No, the, the, the type of relationship we have, we have to, before the settlement, there's something else which happens, which is the foundation of the settlement. The, the settlement itself is predicated by a process which is where the problem actually exists. Mm. It comes after that fact, but its justification is built uh, on something else, you know. Whites, in fact, they have taken settler up at various points in time. There are many white schools in South Africa, for instance, called settlers. I'm sure some of you have been to Settlers High, uh, the Settler Monument. Uh, this, it's a benign term. Abashan, the 1827, okay? The point is that the foundation of white presence and the very thing which creates blacks, which converts blacks from something else, Ama Africa, into Abandabamiyama, uh, is the phenomenon of conquest, okay? Now, you know, conquest is a process which happens following military defeat, okay? So, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a process which happens after military defeat in terms of which the defeated, at the threat of, the, of, of losing his life, accepts particular conditions. Conquest is also the foundation of slavery. In many of the texts in political philosophy, uh, for instance, so, you know, in... Western philosophy, in fact, as far back as Plato's Republic, but especially later in Aristotle and taken up in the Middle Ages by Thomas Aquinas, is a doctrine called just war theory, okay? Just war theory is a basic, is an area of theory which attempts to consider the conditions under which one may ethically go to war with another, it has two purposes. The first set of purposes is to consider the conditions under which one may ethically or justly enter into combat with another. The second set of considerations which fall under just war theory 
is once one is engaged in war with another, what is the ethical way to conduct war? Okay. But South Africa was definitely taken by war, you know. So the point is to understand that uh, white uh, settlers must be distinguished from other varieties of people present in the, by focusing on the origin of title. So the point is that whites are not immigrants, right? Uh, an immigrant is someone who comes into the, the etymology of the world. The word immigrant means to, to come into, to move into, you know, to move into something which exists. But the foundation of conquest was that there is nothing there. Well, there are no people. Or, you know, the variety of people, of things that appear to be people are not quite people. And so they, they can't own this thing. And therefore, we are not moving in, you know. We are creating. That's why South African history begins in 1652, apparently. Because there was no history to begin with. Okay, so immigration is the recognition of an existing people and place, of a culture and language, and moving from one place and becoming part of that which you recognize as existing. Conquest, on the other hand, is founded on the negation of the very thing which is there and exists, and supplanting on top of it something real, because that which is already there is not really there. And the question of whether we are there or not is one that uh, Western philosophers have taken very seriously. Racism understood in, in philosophical terms suggests that black people, if you like, do not have an ontology. They have what you call an onticity, a thinghood, okay? <coughs> ontology or human being, human being understood as no, not a noun, but uguba umundu, human being, being human rather, is a specific kind of existential activity that requires the self-consciousness distinguished from other kinds of entities by the very presence of their self-consciousness. So they are beings which can inquire into the nature of their own beings. This is what leads Hegel, for instance, in his lectures on the philosophy of history, says that Africa south of the Sahara Desert has no history. This may seem peculiar, but history understood as a technical discipline is supposed to be the study of motion, of human development, of human self-consciousness. So a historical people in one generation acquire consciousness of themselves and their environment, accumulate that knowledge, and pass it on to another generation. So that generation after generation, there's a progress in this consciousness, an improvement in man's understanding of the world and himself. This would be seen by the resolution of problems, of social, <coughs> medical, scientific variety. So the point is that in Africans, you have the kind of activity that you have in the natural kingdom. Horses don't have a history, all right? Because horses are thought to be entrapped in a cyclical motion. Each generation of horses runs on the grass, uh, runs around, has children, and dies. Each grass runs around, has children, and dies. You, you understand? This is a cyclical motion which supposedly exhibits no progress, no consciousness. So the, the idea in Hegel is that blacks are really just like horses or monkeys, if you like. That's a favorite because they look kind of human-like. But if you examine their contents, there really is not, no human being to speak of. Mm -hmm. this, is the, this is a founding assumption which, in fact, rationalizes a, a, a variety of activities which have the, the foundation of the South African state, okay? Uh, in many of the early constitutions of the Boer republics, the status of, of blacks was very clearly not that of human beings. 
they were not legal subjects but objects. In any case, the point is that, the point about the Azanian tradition, and uh, I really hope that you take this, you, you stop singing that Amapunu stuff, you know. Uh, otherwise, you should just hand in your t-shirts. <laughs> 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 Now, the, the, the point is that, you know, I mean, the Boas have some, some degree of sophistication, but sometimes if you read the things that they wrote, they are quite amusing. Um, the point is, South Africa produces a, a hierarchical ontology of people. Supposedly, the white man is the human being proper, and all those who are not white deviate from true and proper humanity to the degree that they approximate white or not. You know, so in Indians or colored people or so-called colored people, because they have some white ancestry, are half humans. You know, the Orientals uh, are, are you know are also partially human, and then the black or the Bantu represents the absolute other of true humanity. And you know, this, this hierarchy, which is pigmentocratic, generally you don't find darker ones very high up on the line. So it seems the lighter you are, the more human you become, and the darker you are, the less human you become. Mm -hmm. But you know, if, if, you, if you read the definition of races within the Population Registration Act, it's, it's quite amusing. So just a, just a sample. A white person means a person who in appearance obviously is or is generally accepted as white, but does not include a person who, although in appearance obviously a white person, is generally accepted as a colored person. Mm. Can you make any sense of it? <laughs> now, native, on the other hand, in, in terms of the population registration act, in fact, if you look at the activity of the Boas, you see a bit of madness, because when they came into power in 1948, the first, the first act year of parliament, the first obsession that they had was to prevent sexual activity between blacks and whites. Even before they had determined by law who was supposed to be black and white, the first thing they did, you see that the anti-miscegenation Mixed Marriages Act come before the Population Registration Act. Uh, you know, in any case, native means a person who is or generally accepted as a member of any Aboriginal race or tribe in Africa. A colored person, on the other hand, is de defined as a person who is not a white person or a native. <laughs> no, nobody knows what's going on. <laughs> nobody knows. <laughs> now, the ANC's uh, own racial imagination when dealing with the problem of this raciology, and this raciology was translated at an existential level for blacks, it, it determined a lot of things. Of course, you know this too well about where you could eat, where you could go to school, uh, what your life expectancy would be. I mean, by its juridicization, a, a, a false idea discredited by biological science was turned into a political and economic reality through the use of the law and other institutions. The ANC's response to this, uh, you know, was largely an adherence to the four nations thesis. So later the Indian was added to this racial typology. So, uh, you know, so the, the, the ANC's doctrine uh, re really accepted, accepted the reasoning, I mean, that there are four distinct racial groups. The difference even in the ANC's most radical response is about the content of these four groups and, and, and the basis of the distinction, but there was no challenge really about the tenability of speaking of four, four different peoples, uh, you know, 
uh, in Lembede's version, you know, taking the, the nationalist theory of people like Fichte, you know, he speaks of national spirits and destinies on the basis of these four categories. <laughs> the PAC's doctrine, uh, you know, which, which Sobukwe describes as non-racialism, um, you know, which is often uh, dismissed or made fun of by ignorant people uh, who believe that Sobukwe was naive. Uh, I mean, Sobukwe says uh, there's one race, the human race, but in fact, his approach is the repudiation of the tenability of distinct racial types. That doesn't mean that he, in fact, also at the same time denies the social, historical, and political existence of race and, and the reality which the fiction has generated. So, so Uwe, rather than speaking of biological categories or describing who appears as this or that, instead defines the populations on the basis of their title to territories. So he describes whites, he doesn't use that word, he doesn't describe them as whites, but describes them as Europeans. You know, when, when he defines European, the words conqueror and usurper appear. Europeans are those who have title to territory in Europe who have conquered, usurped title, and are the oppressors of Africa. He calls them a foreign minority. A foreign minority who has title in Europe, but has stolen title here in Africa and oppresses African people. These are Europeans. Their definition, the political origins of Europeans are through the conquest of the indigenous people. You, you understand? So it has nothing to do with whether they are pink or whether they speak, what language they speak, uh, whether they are intelligent or stupid. What it has to do is that to be white, to be European, is to be a land thief. By very definition for Sohugwe, Europeanness in Africa is to be a land thief. The, the definition of a European in South Africa is conqueror. Now, some objections may arise about the fact that we, you know the, the wars which we initially fought were either with the Dutch or English, and there were many Jewish immigrants, there were people like Helen Zill uh, who come after. But the point is, they inherited stolen title and were invited as whites precisely to share in the spoils of conquest. Mm -hmm. And so through sharing, they, they immigrated. Those ones are, are immigrants. They would argue we are immigrants rather than conquerors. But they immigrated into white South Africa. I mean, they immigrated into stolen property. They didn't immigrate into, in, into Azad, but into South Africa, you know. So in any case, Africans are defined in their converse as precisely the indigenous conquered people, the oppressed whose title has been stolen and usurped by Europeans. Uh, of course, so Uwe doesn't take seriously or discuss the question, the so-called colored question, which you saw is rather a strange variety which says uh, neither native nor European. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's quite curious. Uh, so in any case, Indians are then described as those who have title to territory in India. Uh, and you know, they are historical, the historical foundations of their presence is discussed. But the point is that the distinctions that we make between peoples are not of an ontological variety of the kinds of beings that they are, but of the history of their political existence, their relationship to land is how people are defined. Biko later takes on, in the spirit of the Azanian tradition, Biko uh, breaks, you know, so we begin with Lembede, with the Four Nations thesis, which largely derives itself still from these categorizations which are produced by the state. In Sobukwe, we have a deviation which moves from the biologistic language of race 
and, and totally away from any kind of idea of a, a, an ontology but, and moves to the political basis and construction of race. Abigo takes this challenge up but you know, dissolves the Indian question, focusing largely on an antagonism between conqueror and conquer. And he understands the Indian people uh, to constitute part of the black community. This is still a debate which happens a lot between uh, people uh, in, in the liberation movement. Uh, but it, 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 my purpose is to show that we, this non-racialism, Yagasobukwe, is not a, a, a kumbaya, which is a pretension that race does not exist and is not a historical reality. But a turning away from the obfuscation of the language of biology and focusing on the question of title to territory. My, my sense is that uh, the, you know, much of my focus, in fact, today is on the question of shuffle, given the, what day tomorrow is. Um, Sharpville seems to be seems to be something that boggles the mind because it, it appears to make no sense that the Boas would send fighter jets to a township, Namahibo, in order to 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 kill uh, people who were marching peacefully to the police station. It doesn't appear to make sense when one examines the consequences of that massacre. I think, first, there's a necessity of a historical reinterpretation of Sharpville. One, I think Sharpville was an important site because of what happened. But as you know very much, you know, Philip Hosanna, it was much bigger than Sharpville. You know, there were eruptions in Orlando. There were eruptions in Cape Town as part of the same protracted process. So Sharpville, of course, something happened, but I think the focus on Sharpville and even its description as a massacre, rather than as a stand, uh, you know, it, 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 it takes away the intention of the people who were engaged in the exercise and rather focuses on what it is that happened to them. You know, South African history is a strange variety that even after 1994, if you examine what we have in, in, in whatever it is that are called stalwarts or political heroes in South Africa, are often varieties of victims. So people that we call heroes typically are fall into one of a number of categories. One. They were murdered. Two, they were imprisoned. Three, they were tortured. These three varieties of things, okay, there's the fourth, they attended a march. But these three, four varieties of things that happened to people have produced Amastal words where if you ask, would let time and Liela Yenzan? But Amapunu, I'm shy of life. Amapunu, I'm shy of life. Why city power? No one can tell you. Mahu to your chest and Unchita attended a march. Wabanjo Amakada and went to prison. The cow. How? I mean, so who was a chest on Heroes Day in Orlando? You know, brought attention to the question of historical interpretation. He insisted that in the examination of our history, we ought to recognize that they are heroes, are our scoundrels, and our scoundrels are their heroes. <laughs> the insight is precisely that whomsoever the white supremacist system praises, we ourselves ought to look at with a great deal of suspicion. <laughs> and then those who we do look at with suspicion would usually be praised by the white supremacist system. If we produce a critical re-examination of our heroes, I won't mention their names. 
I assure you that these varieties of political heroes that I've described are the majority of what you find, even some with buildings named after them. But why is it There is something. There is something which is seriously wrong, and it, this is, is really it, it really invites a question. Now, what is said about Sharpeville is the conversion of people who actually did do something into mere victims of violence by describing simply a stand and orchestrated political motion that was designed to bring insurrection, to bring the state to its knees, are simply described as victims of a massacre. People who take a stand, you know, deliberate, studied political action, calculated to end the system, are simply converted into victims. And white historians love it. There, there's, there's several books, you know, written by white historians on the massacre. But I think the massacre itself really needs to invite us to examine precisely what is it that the Boas found so threatening that they responded with this kind of unprecedented force. The ANC had been in existence when the PAC left for about 48 years. It had never been banned. It had been allowed to exist and conduct its business. In its early meetings, Smart was invited to address mm. our soul. <laughs> hey. Truly is described by several of these guys as a reasonably minded African. <laughs> there was no problem. The PAC leaves within a year of its formation. Six months. Everything is over. The liberation movement must be banned. Why? What exactly is it that had changed in the understanding of the people who had the levers of the state. Now, we know from many historical accounts, Philip Frankel conducted a study in 1999 on Sharpville that there were many spies in PAC cells. There's probably spies in the secret. There were many spies, and even I was who knew of some of them, who were sent even at the time when planning was being done. There was a serious intelligence operation in Sharpville in Orlando. <coughs> so in terms of the theory of what Abosso Bukwe were trying to do, the Boas were definitely in the know, you know. They were definitely in the know about what these guys were actually up to. And the point was that, of course, the system is untenable. Uh, but the point was that if the Boas enforce their own law, it will lead to the destruction of their own system. They can't arrest all black people. If we all hand ourselves in and break the past law, and they arrest us, who's going to work in their restaurants? Who's going to do the work in South Africa if, if you arrest all of us? And this was the challenge which was exerted. That, so, the point about conquest is precisely that, in some sick way, conquest is a voluntary relationship. I say this uh, under, so, you know, in, in many of the doctrines you see that the engagement in the combat of war entitles once the engagement has begun. Both parties in the war have the right to kill each other. Oh, Mara, my sister. <laughs> the engagement in the conduct of war suspends the, it suspends the rest of the law. So during that time when we're engaged in a declared war, we have the right to kill each other. Both of us are intending to kill each other. That's the objective of the combat. Mm. Now, if I should defeat Umas Kole, but somehow not kill him in the process, in terms of much of the theories of war, I have a right to kill Maskole because he was trying to kill me. Now, if 
I allow my scholar to live in terms of Hobbes, Locke, you know, a number of European philosophers argue that his life belongs to me. Because I had the right to kill him when I did, and I didn't, his life belongs to me. And so now he's my prisoner of war or my slave. But Maspole, of course, can either comply uh, with this and serve me as his master, or he can die, you know. If I have too much force of arms, he can try to resist and certainly die. But his decision to live as my slave with me as his master is perhaps a decision to fight another day, uh, but it's one in which he consents. It's a variety of consent that isn't proper because it's, it's consent against the pain of death, you know. But Oksalayo, you have the right to die. And your choice not to die is the foundation of our relationship in which I'm your master. You know, so so who has recognition of this fact that why are a small minority of people who are holding us in terms of this contract? If we simply refuse to participate, the system could be ended immediately. Mm. This was the plan that if our daddy just decide that they'll no longer stand this shit, there's no necessity for anyone to even take arms. It can be stopped. They predicted it would take three years to stop it. The plan that they had was supposed to last until 1963, by which it would all be over. In fact, many accounts say that at the time that they were standing at the police station in Washington, the Boers asked them, some of the police asked them, Guti, so if you guys take over now, are you going to throw us into the sea? You know. Mm. These were questions which were asked, you know. But the point was that this thing can be ended, can be ended simply by our consensus and standing together. We can end this thing they projected in three years. Now, this, more than any previous political action which had taken place, appeared to scare these guys. I mean, it's something which remains to be studied, but there were 14 fighter jets flying a sharp V, Amahibo, Forabo Mama Baseson Dueni, who were singing songs, but it, it doesn't appear to make any sense that you would show such a force of arms to something which is supposedly so benign, except if you associate this, if you believe that this action is an existential threat to the system which you are pushing, you know. And I believe this is, is precisely what was the problem. Of course, we know the series of steps which follow, even after Cape Town, Sobukwe's imprisonment, his isolation from the rest of the prisoners, and the extraordinary terms of his political imprisonment, which comes from parliament, uh, just betrays a great deal of fear, you know. The erasure of any records of his speech, you know. It's so difficult to conduct research on the man today precisely because of this. But as we see, in the same way that this action is dealt with with this kind of death of force, so too proponents of the Azanian tradition are, are generally just don't live. So Bukwe himself is killed. Biko is killed very early on, you know. The, the, the point is that this thing, I mean, I, I always refer to Elias in Gwedibe's book, uh, Here is a Tree. At the, in the addendum at the end of that book, there's a parliamentary inquiry in which the liberal politician, Helen Sussman, asked the government, why is it that this guy is being imprisoned by, by parliament? What is it? She actually asked them, what are you so afraid of? What is it about this man that scares you so much that you have to take these extraordinary means? Despite the strange way in which this worked, the Boers had prided themselves on having a, a democracy of some sort which operated on the rule of law. The creation of the Sobukwe Clause was a deviation from what had otherwise been 
a rather fair record of due process which they followed in terms of their own perverse laws. But in this instance, they deviated from all of this in order to clamp down something which they thought was truly dangerous, you know. So, you know, this is, this is a, you know, this is, 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 is something which really requires some examination, Uti. Exactly what is it, Nje, that creates this kind of threat and the response which we get from the state too. Now, I think it's precisely out of moving from the focus, which had been the thrust. I, I mean, you, you guys know that upon departure from the Congress, the PAC did, in its inaugural Congress, declare that the ANC had left the ranks of the liberation movement. You know, you know the, the judgment of the ANC was that it no longer had the right to call itself a liberation movement and was could be properly described as a civil rights movement. Um, what it understood the antagonism in South Africa to be was Amapun rather than Abamshor, a particular regime of whites rather than white supremacy in itself. You know, that the extension of rights to blacks, especially the right to vote, was the very objective of the struggle. But in the Azanian tradition, you know, I saw you guys putting up the five pillars the other day somewhere on Twitter. Is this problem of self determination, you know, the restoration of title to territory and sovereignty over it? When you say, I mean, apparently, when the Boers had killed a lot of people who were still alive and wounded, a lot of them were killed while they were lying down, finished off by the police. Mm -hmm. who from onlookers who survive say Amapunu were saying things like say say we lay Africa nai Africa ya you know <laughs> saying you know taunting back the slogans which were being thrown but the the problem of this existential threat is exactly that rather than asking for accommodation from the city the Azanian approach was the repudiation of the very system itself, the end of South Africa. <coughs> and this is something which these guys don't want. You know, it's something, it, it, it constituted the ultimate threat. Playing within the system, asking for a seat at the table is fine, but making the point that the table is actually ours is, is another point altogether and something which needed to be suppressed. Now, it appears that from that point in time afterwards. I mean, the, the point about conquest also is that it's an illegitimate claim to title. After conquering a territory, conquerors often attempt to legitimate their title to territory through the rewriting of history. The apartheid state is a famous instance of people who attempted to rewrite South African history. It is claimed by many African nationalist historians that the Bantu arrived after the war, or by better accounts that we arrived in South Africa at the same time. This was something which was taught in schools in South Africa until the 1980s, that we arrived here at the same time. You know, Of course, at the time that they were killing people and hunting the Khoisan, in, they knew very well that they, they, they arrived and found people there. But of course, in order to legitimate title, a claim was made which has now enjoyed a resurgence in popular discourse that there was a coterminous arrival between the conqueror and the conquer. And the purpose of this fabrication is to erase the fact of conquest, mm. to suggest that we weren't conquered, we found empty land here. And this is something which they still rather like to sustain, you know. So the point is now, of course. We know that the, the latest trick which they play in one of these techniques of legitimation is to claim that they band to themselves as well are conquerors uh, of the, of the so-called Khoisan people, right? You are familiar with this other trick, most, no? That, now the point is that you must now keep quiet because if you yourself conquered the Khoisan, we must all give back the land to the Khoisan then. 
or we must shut up and leave things the way that they are. Because we all of us are, are thieves who have stolen from the poison. So the first trick is to deny that anything is stolen at all. If that trick doesn't work, the second trick is that we have all stolen something. So we must shut up and keep the loot. Of course, this is a problem that I hope doesn't succeed. I've seen that it's a trick that seems to work with a lot of people. Uh, that rather disturbs black people into some state of silence. Um, now, the, the problem with this claim is that let's suspend Let's suspend for a moment the anthropological fiction of the Khoisan people. Um, but the various groups of people who arrived here first, uh, by the time that the Bantu arrived in Southern Africa, in South Africa in particular, there was a long period of cooperation. One, these are people who themselves migrated here after the Ice Age. So Africans have been moving up and down the continent. The PAC insists every inch of Africa belongs to us. In fact, even the Population Registration Act strangely defines native as any of the tribes aboriginal to Africa. It, it seems to rather be in agreement with the doctrine of the PAC. But the point is that in fact, I think the Kosa people are the most Khoisan people that there are today in terms of numbers of survival, in terms of their cosmology. Now, it's, it's strange because according to the claim, in terms of which the Khoisan people are now represented by the so-called colored people, one is only indigenous if one both, let's speak the language of blood, has both Khoisan blood and white blood, then one is indigenous. If one has so-called Bantu blood and Khoisan blood, one is not indigenous. <laughs> you see this strange trick, that only those who can claim whites as their ancestors are indigenous. But peoples, Bantu peoples who have long relations of intermarriage and cultural transmission uh, with the same communities of people are constituted as not indigenous. It's, it's quite a, a, a curious trick, you know, but which is one of the fictions of the historical reconstruction of conquest as legitimate title. The purpose of this thing is that we must stop claiming that they've stolen our land because we have also <coughs> stolen some land. So history becomes a very important enterprise in the discourse of conquest because e even though the foundation of the relation, the most honest whites, I mean, I think Mwetama was debating Davi Ruet, I think it's Davi Ruet, an African economist, who eventually conceded and said, it's fine, then conquer us. Uh, but you must know that after you've conquered us, someone else will conquer you, and it will continue to happen that way. So I mean, the, the, the more honest whites cannot deny the foundation of title in South Africa. But the point of the Sharpeville massacre is precisely that I think this is the closest in terms of political action that we had to the end of South Africa. And I think ever since then, the, we haven't approximated this, this, this kind of closeness to the end. The Boers were studying a number of different resources. In some strange way, I mean, the, the period of time when Sharpeville happened, there was a, I mean, you know that at the inaugural meeting of the PAC, 
uh, word was sent by Painduruma and Nemandi Azikwe as well, you know, that other Pan-Africanist leaders, new presidents of other African countries, recognized the PAC as the legitimate representative of African people here at home, you know, recognized common cause with the PAC and its objections to what had happened within the Congress movement. And some of the concerns of the Boas were based on studying comparatively the situation in Ghana, for instance, where a similar thing had happened within Guruma's gang in an older party, having criticized their old guard for its conservatism, forming a new party, and then gaining independence from the British shortly after. It was not simply a study and spying on its internal activities, but the PAC was itself inspired by a comparative study of activities in other parts of the continent, and the Boas intelligence was quite aware of, of their communications. But the, the, great, the great tragedy is that, of course, the PAC in exile uh, you know, is a disaster. And after 1994, we have a great deal of problems as far as the negotiation, especially after the Museneke gang decide to participate. But the problem is the, the meaning, I mean, what the point at which we began here, you know, the point at which we began, I mean, Usoli Mapaila recently made claims which Usobu were headed easy, you know, uh, you know, comparatively easy. Yeah, than the communists. You know. I, I, I'm sure we, we don't need to discuss that this is a, a ridiculous claim. Um, but what, what is truly of concern is, you know, I, I, I would really like to know the rationale which your mother body is using presently in order to justify participation within the, 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 the electoral sphere. Um, you know, when Sobukwe and, and the others are charged, they refuse to plead, you know, and question the very legitimacy and foundations of the law. This is, is a problem, you know. They refuse to plead, saying that the law has no legitimacy. It's not possible to charge us with a law which actually has no popular foundation. You're dictators, usurpers of title to territory who have made this law, but this cannot be a just law because it has no foundation. By what authority can you actually impose such a law? This is the nature of the objection. Babo Oshwe, in, in any case. But the, the point which we're invited to observe in terms of the Azanian tradition is that the constitution of South Africa today is a successor in title uh, to, to the apartheid state. The point is that if we are saying that the fundamental problem is not apartheid, is not Amapuri, the problem is conquest, then conquest begins in 1652, you know. This is when the, the, the defeat of the Khoisan people happen, and there are many other subsequent defeats as these guys move into the interior. There's Hinza, Isangan, Bambata, you know, until the, the death of the Zulu nation, uh, at, where conquest is complete, and the relations of subjugation have their basis there. And the law is erected upon this relation of domination, which has its foundations on conquest. Now the point is, uh, the constitution itself is a successor in title. It continues this very same tradition, uh, except that people supposedly sat at a table and agreed to. Uh, but in, in fact, it doesn't deal with the fundamental antagonism of conquest. The point is that uh, South Africa has had many constitutions before the present constitution, right? We, we, had the, we had the 1910 Union Act, we had the 1961 constitution after Sharpeville and the Boas became a republic, they had a constitution. In 1983, there was the tricameral constitution which led to the birth of the UDF. 
uh, in contest of that constitution. And then we had the, the interim constitution and then this one. The poor republics, of course, uh, Transvaal, Orania, Freistat, uh, had constitutions. But none of the previous <coughs> constitutions in South African history have ever been supreme. So the constitution has never been the supreme law in South Africa until black people were supposed to take power. The Boers had parliamentary supremacy. That means that if you had enough of them taking a decision, they could turn that decision into law without asking anybody else. If enough Boers agree, if white people agree that they are making a law, all they need to do is agree in parliament and then they make that law. But immediately it was that black people were supposed to go to parliament. Parliament was subjected to a constitution so that if they agree, they first need to answer to a constitution. And if the constitution says that it's okay what they've agreed, then it can be made law. But if the constitution doesn't agree to what they've said, then it is called unconstitutional. Now, the point is, the question is what kind of a democracy that really is or, or can be when people are unable to make a decision unless it's consistent with the constitution which they are not responsible for writing themselves. When the ANC entered into negotiations with the Boers, the Boers in 1992 declared held a referendum in which he consulted the white population and asked them if he should go and enter into negotiations in order to end apartheid. He, of course, he promised them, among other things, that they would keep their property. This is one of the undertakings that he then made during this, this vote. The white population took a decision to allow the to negotiate on their behalf. The ANC held no such referendum. Black people did not appoint the ANC to go and enter into discussions with the Boers. Yet the results of their discussions with the Boers were through an agreement at the end of Cordesa. It was agreed that they would be in the new constitution, agreed to by a minority of Boers, regardless of what an election found. There were concessions made about provisions to be included in the constitution, regardless of democracy. So the point is that the constitution is declared dictatorship. I mean, it, it is an agreement. It, it's conquest yet again, you know. And so long as it prevails over parliament, we are, of course, at liberty to make our own constitution. But this is not a constitution which we made. We, we can go through a detailed critique of the constitution itself. But the point is that it is not our constitution. And of course, the possibility condition which the Constitution set for even participating in the parliamentary process is to swear to uphold and defend the Constitution. <clears throat> the foundations of South Africa in its continuity from 1910 are sustained through the Constitution. So I can't see, I can't see how it's possible to fulfill the task which was set by Chapel to end South Africa under the auspices of the Constitution. It would appear to me that the task which you are faced with today is a militation against the Constitution for the repudiation, the setting aside of the Constitution in order that a Constitution of our making can take place because this is not our Constitution. But the participation in the process of the constitution through, through, through the road to democracy, through the election, I, I cannot see that this will be the way in which we end the constitution, through the constitution. Mm -hmm. we, we can stop it there. Thank you, guys.